Thank you. <coughs> there are some aspects we have to 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 uh, to analyze, and we have fundamentally three different stages of patient. So, when all the casuistry they report, we have done uh, thirty-five. Uh, epicondylitis in treating with PRP, in treating with shock wave, in treating it surgically. But every single patient can be different. I have a patient who had epicondylitis because of an osteoma osteoid and was seen by several and several doctors before. So every single patient, if you have a calcification, is different. If you have a calcification and you put a steroid injection, maybe they are better for three hours. If they have pain at night, you probably you can't do anything conservatively. Which kind of racket do they use when they play tennis? Which kind of work they do if they are if, they, if their mechanical work is completely different from other from other patient? So I'm not sure if all these casuistry they take into consideration a single job of every single patient. But you have to deal with this patient, and you have to deal day by day, exactly understanding what they need from you. And Dr. Nish said that there are some histological uh, differences, and it's true. Absence of angioblastic tissue in stage one, presence in stage two, a large amount in stage three. But how can we know before to operate the patient how is the histological situation? It is important to understand if the patient has pain after stress, pain during activity, pain uh, along the day, uh, along the night. And if you can, uh, maybe locked for some time the elbow and avoid overuse, stage one they do better without any treatment at all. Stage two, maybe they need some rehab, some eccentric. I know there is no evidence, but I'm still asking to myself when I see a patient, in which category of this patient I have to put this new guy. If I have continuous pain, some patient come to visit you in clinic where they are completely exhausted by the pain during day, during night. If you put in a back slap, they don't are better sometimes. They feel worse. So you have to take in consideration all these kind of thing from the practical -like point of view. And of course, candidate for surgery is th the last thing you have to do. But some of these, they need sometimes. How can we ask to Roger Federer avoid overuse? It's impossible, of course. Can ask to modify training. Mm, I, I, I'm not sure they can modify training. Maybe they can modify the intensity of the, of the training. Can modify the racket is impossible for a professional. Maybe possible for me. I can play tennis once a, once a week. If the, the racket, the, the, the cords are, are too tensed or are too low, the tension of the racket, you can have some trouble with your epicondy, uh, epicondyle. Splint and counterforce tutor. You know, the counterforce tutor, you know, the small thing we put here to the patient, they can, uh, can give some trouble to the interosseous nerve also. We have, to, we, have, we have to be very careful about using this. And splinting, you, how can we ask to a, a patient who has a mechanical work every evening put for 45 minutes in a splint in full extension to rest the, uh, the, ext the, um, the extension muscle and then do some eccentric work is too difficult for a patient because you can have some result maybe in four months, five months. is a long time. I'm not talking about professional, of course. So after six months of conservative treatment and after radiological clinical evaluation and pain at night in my my feeling is really one of the most important thing that can that um, bring me to decide to do uh, that this patient is candidate for for an operation. It depends from the patient. It depends from uh, the radiological evaluation. But what we offer to the patient is a manual chart. We can do growth factors alone or plus scarification under local anesthesia is not an operation. When we do scarification, we use a small blade, it's a one centimeter cut, and the patient is quite comfortable. They go home after uh, half an hour. It's a small thing for the patient, and from the psychological aspect, is something important. Why scarification? PRP needs a target cell that is not present where we have chronic. 
situation is present when we have acute situation. If you do scarification, you can start to increase this amount of cells, and maybe they do better. But we saw, we see, we see the result in a second. Arthroscopic treatment. When I started uh, my career, really, 25, 27 years ago, I, work, I was working, I was trained in a big department, very famous in Italy for hand surgery. And I tell you that probably in that department, we did uh, 3,000, 4,000 uh, upper limb surgery per year, small and big, but no more than 10 epicondylitis were, were taken to the operative room. So I, when I started to work by myself, I was thinking I have to do epicondylitis open, close, and I still had some, I was skeptical about the atroscopic technique. So I started to do open, and I was, you know, happy about 75, 80%, to be honest, about the results. And then I operated eight years ago a friend of mine, and they said, well, we can do arthroscopically, we can try. And, uh, and then now I, 85% um, I do arthroscopically. Talking about PRP, we took in consideration just few cases under local, eight cases plus clarification, eight cases only PRP, and uh, only PRP, we had uh, residual pain more than 45% of the patient. With clarification, we have residual pain in 35%. Means probably that scarification can be useful. We don't know only scarification. We need to do only scarification without PRP. It's a controversial situation, but you know, it's something really really small procedure and it doesn't involve so much time for the patient, so it can be a good, a good option at the beginning of the treatment. Then we have a Chen Baker arthroscopic classification. We have inflammation, frying deep of the ACRB without a tear, linear tear, a lesion with a big retraction of the ACRB. When we talk uh, arthroscopically, we think the ECRB is just uh, uh, a small part of the insertional area on the, uh, on the lateral crest of the humerus. And uh, some uh, doctors presented all around the world technique in which they took out just a small part of the tendon in that area. This is not probably uh, really mm, useful we need to take out all the part, because otherwise you can leave some uh, uh, part of the tendon in this position, and that the pain is uh, worse than before. What we do when we do an elbow arthroscopy, and uh, we do a brachial plexus isolation, then we put the patient to sleep, and wake up the patient at the end of the procedure, show the movement of the hand, and then sensitivity, and then we put the, the, um, the anesthetic in the catheter. We don't do only under local and under uh, local regional anesthesia. We use the prone decubitus. You see these two fingers. They are against the ulnar nerve. All the procedure, they are feeling the ulnar nerve. If I go too close, my assistant say, oh, Three posterior portals, two anterior, anter one anterior, supramedial and supralateral anterior. And talking about elbow arthroscopy, if you start from medial and if you go to lateral, don't forget to go from medial to lateral, coming from inside to outside. Because if you have a big man with big muscle, you don't understand exactly where the interosseous nerve is. So in this case, you can have trouble with the uh, interosseous nerve. And there is a, a, a legal problem in a patient in Italy, operating in Rome, in which they coming from outside, they just with the needle went across the nerve. So it's quite good coming from inside to outside for the sterna, external um, approach, because with the, the, the blunt troca, you can go smooth and smooth, and then you can feel your, your portal. You have visualized the lesion, debris the lateral capsule, 
release the ECRB tendon, but always anterior to the lateral crest. If you release posterior to the lateral crest, you can release the lateral collateral ligament. This is not good. Microfracture of the cortication is something that really is uh, uh, controversial. Now I think nobody is doing more, you see, the, uh, more uh, the cortication on the lateral aspect of the elbow. We are inside the posterior compartment. Also, if I work mainly anteriorly, I start from posterior. You see the coronoid there, where well, it's part of the coronoid, all the electronon, and you see the under tricep recess. No pathology in this case. Some small synovitis. I don't feel uh, every single time the fat pad that uh, the radiologist doctor presented. Before we had the lesion here, you see. Lesion is there. So we pass across and we open and then we pass across first with the, with, with the from inside to side. Then we enlarge and we took out all this part of the insertional area. At the beginning, I remember in Italy, some friends, they did just, just this small release. I don't think it, it is enough. You have to take it out, all the insertional part coming from up until here in order to detach every single, every single part. You can use the, the uh, radio frequency. Uh, well, in this part, but you know, the, the interosseous nerve is just behind here, so take care. You can do the cortication like in this case increasing the blood supply. But I'm not so, I, I just stopped to do this, uh, this lateral, this, uh, uh, this part of the procedure. I just take it out, everything, and I want to be sure to be really anterior to the crest. We put in an elbow sling, uh, 90 degrees of flesh for 12 days, and we start active and passive range of motion in day three but very, very, very gently, maybe a couple of times every, every day. And if we talk about post-op rehab in elbow surgery, it's really something really complicated. This patient, they do well, but they, uh, we have some uh, small percentage of patients that still have problem. I think it depends mainly on the, the time when they go back to work, if they are work, if they are worker, or especially if they are manual worker. If they are uh, sportsmen, I don't think they can go back to play before three months from, from, uh, the, from the, uh, the procedure. And then in, 30, in 32 cases, 29 rated better or much better than before, and the patient turned to work in six weeks, but you know, it depends from the work. They probably go back to work if you do arthroscopy before than uh, uh, doing uh, with, 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 op with open surgery. And uh, if you want to do open, because the, 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 um, the topic was close and, and open treatment, you have to remove the pathological tissue. Remove the pathological tissue. You can microfracture or microperforate or decorticate this area. And then you can close after the removal the desire with the aponeurosis, extensor aponeurosis. This is, is done by, by Niels in, in Moribu. Personally, if I, when I did, uh, uh, when I do uh, open epicondylitis, I still uh, uh, take the patient 18 days in above elbow, not fully plastered, just to have some rest, and I start passing movement less than, than when I do arthroscopically and sports at three, four months. Thank you.